Hi, I'm Katie, and this is episode 54 of Ornamentations, which will be a celebration. This marks my second anniversary on Tube, and to celebrate that, I have some very special things to share with you today. I have two fabulous finishes to share, one new, one old. We'll be looking at my previously finished green casket for the first time. And then I also have some great whip progress to share, a tiny little bit of haul, broke my rule, and then some stitchy plans as well as the winner of the Sarah Render giveaway to celebrate my second anniversary on Floss Tube. But we'll start today with my newest finish and that is this happy morning which is now complete it's been mounted ready for framing and i will be taking it to summer school with me if you'll be in attendance make sure to get a look at this one i am so pleased with how this came out since i saw you last i added tony the pony who came off the plum street samplers summer salt boxes chart although i did shorten his legs to make him look more like a shetland pony and less like a horse i put in all the remaining fillers so those would be the pink stars finished the quilt star and then blocked and pinned this ready for lacing Last time I said I hoped I would finish because you never know what surprises color will throw at you and that's definitely really true because the remaining colors to pick here, so the final browns, that dark brown used for the tree trunks and the lighter brown used for Tony the Pony and then that light pink were so difficult to pick. Oh my goodness, I tested 11 picks. 11 light, medium, everything in between. I tried pretty much every pink in the Everest wall line before I finally settled on what I thought was right because you needed a pink that didn't look like a screamer against the green, but stood off out enough from the ground fabric that you could see it when it was used there. That was a difficult task. So those last few steps on this sampler definitely took me much longer than the actual stitching did. The most difficult thing about adding the last colors to a conversion is that they have to work with everything else that you've already done and that can mean sometimes that you need some very specific things and that can be hard to find. This is the, oh, and of course it just went all over the place. I am about to show you the final conversion once I can organize these threads and I'm really really pleased with how it turned out. I was setting everything out last night, ready to do my floss tube today. Looked at this from the hold place. I am such a klutz. I had everything perfectly organized and propped up at an angle so it would sit neatly and not go all over the place and not only did I screw it up I managed to throw everything all over. This is now the final conversion. There will be one more thread added for the kits. That's the yellow which I did not use in my own. I took those elements out but I will include it in the kit so that you can stitch this happy morning exactly as charted if you like. Anyways, so last night I was setting everything out ready for my floss tube this morning and took a look at these threads from a distance and thought, oh yeah, you can really see why that works. You have these beautiful, vibrant, really harmonious colors, but then they've got these darker browns, grays, neutrals as just enough of an alloy to keep it from being too sickly sweet. I looked at that group of colors from across the room and thought, oh yeah, that's a good one. I'm really, really pleased with how that came out. So those are the final threads. Some of these do require multiple spools, the green and the dark red in particular. And then kits will be coming on this, but not for a while. We are waiting on the dyeing of one of the reds. It's quite essential to the pattern. So then this is This Happy Morning by Plum Street Samplers. As charted, so you can see, I definitely did make some changes. And just to remind those of you who might be new to my channel or have missed these episodes, I decided to adapt this to turn it into a family heritage sampler honoring 
a family farm on my mother's side where my grandmother and great aunt were born and raised and where my mother spent a lot of time as a child. So I put in my grandmother and great aunt's names to make this into a sister sampler and then just made some other tweaks. But most notably, Tony the Pony, who is the Shetland that lived on the farm. And that's my mother riding him in an old photo. Love it. I think it turned out great. I am just so pleased with this. And then it is pin mounted. I hope that'll focus, probably not. And then just quite lightly laced at the back, just enough to hold those edges down. I am not an expert at mounting things for framing. I'm much better at gluing, but I like pin mounting because I think it gives you more control. You can more easily move things around and adjust them. So what I mean when I say pin mounting is this is on acid-free foam core board instead of mat board. And then that means that you can pin everything in place and then just sink pins at regular intervals to hold everything down. And then if you want to just kind of tweak something, pull the pin, move it, adjust it, sink it back in. So it gives you a great deal of control. And that's why I prefer it to lacing. Although again, I have to disclaim that I'm not an expert. This has been fully blocked to take out all of the distortion, which was considerable because I stitched this in hand. And then the other thing I'd like to note about this is the unequal negative space at top and bottom. So the margin between the edge of the berries and the edge is actually the same top and bottom but it gives the appearance of having more space at the top because there's an unequal amount of negative space. These berries point upwards, these are across, so you've got less visible linen here than at the top. So if I were mounting this again, which totally not doing, did it once, that was enough, this is now ready for framing. I would correct for that because I think it being actually correct is less important than what your eye sees. So I would have added an extra margin just at the bottom to correct for what your eye thinks it's seen. This was, um, it's also on the model, so Paula clearly made the same decision about how to do her margins, but it's pretty great. I love it. I think it's just amazing. Fabulous, 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 fabulous. So again, this will be a kit release date to be announced. So none of the details of the conversion will be shared, but I'm really excited to share it with you. So after I get back from summer school, I will take this off for framing. I'm just so pleased. I think it's absolutely beautiful sampler. It sings the reds, the greens. It's just vibrant and bursting with life and color. It's absolutely gorgeous. And then I'm also going to insert a photograph here of the painting my great grandmother did of this particular farm. So you can see just what I'm talking about when I say family heritage sampler. So that's this happy morning. Now finished and ready for framing. And as I said, coming to summer school with me. Which brings me to now my lone whip. Well, the lone whip that I'm working on. I've got one more whip. And that is AKGIT 1833, a Verlanda sampler by Modern Folk Embroidery. I'm blazing. I am blazing. Check that out. So that would be all of the letters worked across the top, which means I have no more letters to do for quite a while. And that makes me really, 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 really happy. Not only that, I've stitched all the way across the top and everything lines up correctly, which is thrilling. So I am almost a quarter of the way through this sampler. I've got four full trees of life done. When I saw you last, I was working on this fourth one. 
that's now been fully completed and I am a pretty good way through that fifth one. So I'm getting very close to a complete top row here. It's back. See where I'm working right now. And, oh, I did have a flub and that's with this little dividing tree of life. So the other four are all perfectly mirrored and I checked the chart when I was stitching all of those to make sure it was mirrored and then I get all the way over here and I didn't check. I assumed it was mirrored like all the rest and of course that would be the one that's not perfectly mirrored. It was actually truncated on the slide closest to that fifth tree of life to get full room for those flowers. So then I start stitching this, I come over, I realize they're going to run into each other, take a closer look at the chart and was just like, oh crud. There is actually room to put, so that little flower there almost touching the tree of life is missing two stitches. There's room to put those in, but when I looked at the chart, AKGAT clearly wanted just a little bit of margin there. So I left them out. I thought that was a good way to compensate, honestly, there's so much to look at this at in this piece and it's so big that that is just not the kind of thing I will stress out about. But just so everybody knows, I do make mistakes. Yes, that was pure carelessness at work. Although I think, really not gonna notice. Oh, oh, I love this piece. I'm just so thrilled with it and enjoying it so much. Although, as I think I mentioned last time, I think I may slow down once I get to all those medallions, those are going to be less varied and more repetitive than the trees of life, which I have just loved, loved, loved stitching. On the plus side, no letters for the next several pages, so I'm excited about that. I will be taking this to summer school just so I can share this piece with everybody because I love it so much, but I don't think I will be stitching on it. It is very intricate. Um, it's easy to make a mistake on this. As I think I've mentioned before, you do catch your mistakes very quickly because the designs essentially interlock. So when you find out that things aren't meeting up the way they should, you catch your mistakes quite quickly, much more quickly I think you, than you would maybe on something else but it's probably not the best stitch and chat piece. So it's coming along with me, but I don't think I'll actually actively be working on that. So that brings me to what will I work on at summer school? So please be under, um, I may be slow in responding to emails, comments, etc. this week because I'm going to be the attic, shopping up a storm, chatting, stitching. I'm off the grid. I'm on vacation this week. I mean, I'm faculty, so I'm working, but I'm also on vacation. It's a working vacation. My favorite kind. I was going to say something. That was, oh yes, what am I going to stitch at summer school? Unfortunately, I don't have anything already with lots of mindless block stitching. That seems to be an oversight, however, I've been very occupied with AKGIT, so I'm going to forgive myself on that one. So I thought I would just show you some of the things I was thinking about taking with me to stitch. I've more or less already decided, but we'll go through what I was looking at in my thought process. What I think I will take with me in stitch is scattered seed samplers, gathering together pin keep. I really like this little piece. I'm going to stitch it on Wayfarer's cloak and I think, you know, you could get, say, some of the outline of the bird in quite quickly and then that way give you fill in. It's a small, so if you make a mistake, it's not the end of the world. It's going to look beautiful on Wayfarer's cloak, not too many colors. I think that's a great, really easy travel project. So I think I'll be taking scattered seed samplers, gathering together pinky. I did think about my sampler September piece. Yes, I know it's not September, but you know, I just had a big sampler finish, so I'm kind of itching for a new start. 
And that's Oh Sweet Humility, Eliza Townsend's work by Cross Stitch Antiques. I actually bought this at the attic, so it seemed like it would be very fitting to start this there. Cut my linen, which is 45 count Jersey Cream by Legacy Linen. I've got it in a project bag. It's all ready to go, except for the part where I haven't actually, I don't know, picked any of my silks. And there is fill-in. You could start with that bottom part, I think, reasonably well, but this is a large enough piece. I feel like what I would probably do if I started this would be screw it up and then be forced with either junking a large piece of linen or doing a lot of rocking. I don't really like the idea of that as much as I think it's fitting to start this at the attic. So, Oh Sweet Humility is probably going to wait for Sampler September properly. And the other thing I think I will take, because, you know, it's so funny, it's not like I am really going to do any stitching, but I have an absolute horror of being someplace without, you know, all the things to stitch. And it's not like I'm going to the attic. I could buy and get a project if I found myself out of things to stitch and we'll be getting projects at summer school but no I'm a weirdo I want to take all of the things and that reminded me that I do actually have one more whip which I had actually almost forgot about it's been so long and that's Modern Folk Embroidery's Home Sweet Home. I put this aside a while ago but I actually am really far on this. This is on Russian tea cake with a beautiful dark aubergine goblins. 575. Oh, it's stunning. You don't really see the purple. Oh, that's the back. <laughs> don't see the purple as much on camera, but it is there. And it's lovely. And this I could probably stitch, you know, on the plane or something. So I think I'll take this with me as well. Do other people overpack with their stitching when they go places? I think that's probably a fairly common thing. I'm not too alone on that. Although I did, when getting this out, have to smile a little bit because it's got some common features with AKGIT. Single color, same color of linen, dark thread, but the higher count and intricate details on AKIGAT means that <laughs> this looks like a child's crayon drawing in comparison. Absolutely no offense to Jacob. I do love this piece. It's gorgeous. It's just, this is so intensely detailed, especially on the high count that, oh. But this might also be a good travel piece. It's small, it's portable, the chart's only two pages, you've just got one spool of thread. So I think I'll probably bring that along as well. Although I don't know if I'll actually get any stitching done on it. Stay tuned. I also do have some Christmas pieces that I really want to stitch this year. And I had originally thought about maybe starting one of those and bringing it to the attic. But it's going to be hot. It's going to be very, 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 very hot. Just feel like Christmas and snow and Santa is just not going to be a thing that I'm feeling in the Arizona heat in August. So I think it's going to be scattered seed samplers gathering together. Pinky. Good choice. Looking forward to it. I love that chart. And then I am also taking some pieces to the attic and then one of them will be staying behind and I thought I'd show it again. You've seen it before, but since this is the last time it'll be here for a while, let's take one last look at my stitch of Plum Street Samplers, my early days on 5363 Sicilian Marzipan with an original conversion done by me. You can do it in either Swastophene like I did or 103. Color numbers work for the both. I will link the conversion in the description. This was done last year for Sampler September. Beautiful piece. I feel like this chart has been overlooked a little bit. I love the flowers, the graceful trees, the house. This is just gorgeous, gorgeous chart. So uh, this is going to go on display at the attic and definitely I love having it here and looking at it, but I'm a process stitcher. I am not 
hugely attached to my pieces after I stitch them. I love to make them. So sharing this beautiful piece and this chart that I really enjoy with other stitchers, I think is a better use of its time. So it's gonna go live at the attic for a while. So that'll be the last that we see of my early days here on my channel, at least for a while. So I just wanted to share that again quickly before it goes off to its new home. And then, wrote my roll guys I did have a little bit of haul but in fairness I could not pass this up I have been working to get my mom all outfitted for summer school she's coming with me as you've probably heard so I got her a little pouch from the Missy Needle since you saw this last I added a little bit of bling in the form of a beaded fob so this is my beaded spiral rope stitch i've got a tutorial on that and i'll link it so this is a really easy way to make a sparkly little fob so that i've used as trim on panel pillows and that's mostly what the tutorial discusses but you can also just make a little length of it weave one end in to finish it off and then attach the other to just a little clasp and then you've got sparkly bling for a project bag or scissors whatever and then her I will cut you needle book that I made for her and then this is the haul I snagged Lou and Sue's latest collection because I mean is this my mother in an object or what green William Morris floral foliate designs you know I had to have this so I bought it for her this is the folio just gonna put her threads in it she doesn't have that many threads on her current project but you know what she needed a folio I decided that was an executive decision and then the matching project bag because how could you pass up this green absolutely gorgeous i have a lou and sue folio set of my own the katie but this was just perfect for my mom coordinates nicely with her other pieces so she is fully outfitted and ready to go for summer school i'm excited and then oh special 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 so this episode marks my second anniversary on floss tube and to celebrate that i am going to share with you today a very special piece not previously seen on my channel so we've looked at the britter mark casket seen here behind me before on this floss tube if you're not familiar with the britter mark class casket i'll link the episode in which the finish was shown. I can't actually think what it is off the top of my head. 46 maybe? Something around there. It'll be in the description. And then what I will be showing you now is the first casket I ever made which was finished in March 2021. So I am going to pause this, change the camera setup, and then we'll be meeting the green casket. This is the green casket, which is my first completed casket. It's of a different type. Make sure I've got the key in there before we start. From my Britomart casket. The Britomart casket is called a flat top casket. It was from Thistle Threads, as is this one. And the flat top casket, the Britomart casket, is a much simpler type. That's basically a box with an interior tray and some fancy hardware. This is a double casket, a flat top with doors, and as a piece of cabinetry, it's a different kind of thing entirely. So this one has quite a spectacular interior, and we'll be looking at that as well. The green casket is named so not just because of all of the green, but the inspiration behind it. All of my big pieces have a literary inspiration of some kind, and this one is inspired by Marvell's poem, The Garden, specifically the line, annihilating all that's made to a green thought in a green shade. That has always really fascinated me. What is a green thought? 
And then with this casket, I decided to explore the idea, what might a green thought and a green shade look like if it were rendered in fabric? So that was my organizing idea behind the exterior, at least, of this casket. And then the embroidery itself was largely inspired by 17th century Flemish professional embroidery, which is of a very different style than the Britomart casket. The Britomart casket is modeled after the same century, the 17th century, but English amateur schoolgirl embroidery. They lavished time on their pieces. So you see, you see lots and lots of stump work, lots of very time intensive techniques. The Flemish professional embroiderers lavished expensive materials, but use techniques that required less time. They valued their time more than their, their materials as professionals. So with Flemish embroidery, you see a lot of couching, you see a lot of time efficient techniques, and you see a lot of use of metal thread. So that was what inspired this piece, and then we'll start with the doors. Let's see if I can just move this just a touch there. Okay, so the doors have framed cartouches that are silver with spangles, beads, and then this applied silver thread. And they each show a tree with a silver trunk that's been padded first, and then it's got silver thread couched down over it in a technique called Ornoué. And then they have these lovely, very textured canopies that are done with overtwist using slightly different styles and colors of thread to give different techniques and textures. Embroidery always really flattens out on camera, so some of the subtleties of this piece will not come through, unfortunately. You'll have to take my word for it. One of the interesting things in making this was that in deciding to make this green casket to have green be the dominant, almost the only color on this, and that I have very specific ideas about the greens I like, I had a really limited palette, so I had to get very creative that how I used my threads so that it would look harmonious but not all entirely the same. And then this side is again very typical of Flemish professional embroidery. So we have trees in a similar style. That's that silver trunk padded, catch down, and then the mounds underneath them are worked in long and short stitch. That's the same technique that's taught on Queen Anne's Pin Pillow. That's the upcoming class that we took a first look at on the last floss tube. And then the back is a little bit of a stylistic departure. This depicts a scene from the poem with a lot of comic potential in which the poet, okay, how's it go? Stumbling on melons as I pass, ensnared with flowers, I fall on grass. So this depicts our hapless poet Marvell literally experiencing the transformative power of nature. It references the Daphne and, Apo Daphne and Apollo myth, which was sometimes seen on 17th century caskets. So he's transforming in nature very, very fitting for a metaphysical poet. And then he's ensnared with melons and flowers, flailing and falling on grass. This has a little bit of detached needle lace and a bit of texture. I loved those vines. They were drawn from, a, I think it was a 16th century herbarium, which had some beautiful depictions of different plants. I drew on a lot of different sources for this casket. And then the little flowers are just beads. The melons have been lightly padded and then overstitched. And then this is the last sign panel. Again, very Flemish in design and a complement to the other side in composition. You've got the same mounds and again one of those silver trunked trees with a very textured double canopy and then this time i filled it out with lollipop trees the type you see on the lid 
And then those are all French knots that I worked over padding. This is one of my favorite panels on this casket. I love how the composition turned out. And then the green and the silver just pop off the lighter green ground. The green satin I got from Mood. Unfortunately, it's no longer available. It's a really beautiful, beautiful fabric. And then the friezes are all vines accented with silver down the middle, some spangles as well. So this piece has quite a lot of texture and shine to it and you see more of that at different angles, although it doesn't pop off the ground fabric the way that the Britomar casket does. It's much, much flatter following the Flemish inspiration for this piece. The friezes were actually the last part of this casket that was worked. So I had most of this done in the early spring 2020. Did I say I finished this in 21? I finished it in 2020. And I was really stuck on the friezes. I hadn't designed them at that point. I had put everything else on the casket and I thought I would get there and then it would tell me what it needed. I got there, I looked at it, and it wasn't speaking to me at all. I was stuck. And then COVID hit. I live in the Bay Area, so we were on full lockdown early, and I decided it was time to just pick something, stitch it, and finish this casket. So this casket was finished at the very end of March. 2020 and it's an object that I for one very much associate with the pandemic and then let's look at the interior so I will show you the exterior lid but I'll show I'll switch to overhead view here in a minute to show that to you so the interior is meant to be a complete surprise and thematic departure so you've got this restrained harmonious single color green exterior and then you open the casket to find a riot of color and embroidery. To me this suggests nature and then man's cultivation of nature, the garden in the interior. And it is very much a garden because the lid also has a fully embroidered panel inside it. So I'm going to switch to overhead view to show you a few details in that orientation and then we'll come back to this view to look at the rest of the interior. And this is the lid of the green casket which was inspired by a medieval French, sorry, a medieval French manuscript drawing of a walled garden. The original was on white vellum, but I loved the really soft colors of it. So the pink brick of the fountain, the shapes of the trees, the greens and yellows, those are all drawn from my original inspiration. Putting it on the green ground did very much change the composition of how the colors looked. And the original was also in a tall orientation rather than the horizontal orientation, so that also changed it, but I think it was still quite successful. The fountain, which is one of the central features, has worked in gilt silk twist over padding to raise it up off the ground, and then the water are cut beads that I strung on wire and then couched down in shapes to mimic water. They also form the fountain the, sorry, the water, <laughs> the water spray that, come, that is coming out of the fountain. Oh goodness, I'm not doing very well at describing this, am I? And then the palm trees have some detached needle lace leaves that stand up off the ground. Let's give you a better view. And then the trees are worked with French knots, some of which are over padding and some of which are flat on the ground. I also sprinkled some sequins and beads on this front mound here to give it a little more vis visual interest. And then I used um, needle lace stitches. This one is more open and this one is quite closed and dense 
the accent, the color differences between the two dye lots. This is actually the same perlite color, but two different dye lots of it. So the choice of stitch was able to accent the natural differences between the thread. But that's the lid, and let's take a look at the top of the interior. I have trouble with the lock on this one. So to open this one, you unlock the doors first and then you put your key in the interior escutcheon to pop the lid. And that gives us a look at the interior tray. So this has glass bottles and their little compartments oh goodness I really am lost for words and then this which some of you may have seen before on my channel I think I've shared it is a laying tool holder that I made in a dense filling stitch with silver thread on white linen so this is much brighter although you may not be able to see it on video than the Elizabethan Valentine and Queen, Queen Anne's pin pillow which worked on the darker gray um, make the silver a little less intense, but I think in a really good way. This is fashioned after a knife holder in the collection of the Victoria and Albert. It's worked front and back. It's got little tassels on the sides and it holds just a plain laying tool. That sits in this top tray, which can be removed. There's a little hidden button right here and that's how you pop the sliding panel, although we'll take a better look at that when I come back to forward view. So there are all kinds of hidden spaces in this casket, and some of them are here in this top tray. That's one of them. So in addition to the secret button that releases the sliding panel here, there's also a little hidden space underneath the top tray, although I haven't put anything there. And then in the largest part of my top tray, you can see my original posy. So I've worked several smaller ones since then, but this is what really got me started on the technique. I wanted something that would visually fill this tray and then complement the flowers and rich colors of the interior. However, the top does a few other tricks. These sliding panels come out to reveal more hidden spaces. So underneath here, and this is actually a little hard to do from this angle, but there are two hidden drawers under these panels right here that you can pull out. Oh, how clever of me. I put a tassel so that I could actually pull this out. <laughs> so there you can see there are drawers on both sides, but they're quite difficult to remove without disturbing the posy, which is quite delicate, so I prefer to just leave them in place. And then you can also remove the pincushion, which is its own separate unit, and it also has another secret drawer in there. This casket has a lot of secrets in it. Just put this back. And then the other thing I would like to show you on overhead view before we go back to regular view is a better look at the interior panel that forms the lid. Hold on, I'm gonna pause this and move the camera a little closer. This is one of my favorite features in this casket. I absolutely love this panel. It was inspired by embroidered vestments worked by Helena Wintour. She had a beautiful panel of needle lace roses with scalloped detailing, just like on these. Although I've tweaked the composition design and working a little bit to better fit my own taste. And I was so inspired when I saw it, I knew I wanted to do something like it for my own casket. So the main roses here are all detached needle lace. And again, they're edged with a silver scallop. So all of these were worked off the fabric and then layered and stitched on 
which gives them a really nice shape. And then they are wonderfully sparkly because of all of the silver. In addition to the silver scallop edging on each petal, they have a silver center. The rosebuds here have more of the stretched silver scallop covering the under stitching. There's silver twist edging around the needle lace sepal. There is la double ladder stitch worked over these stems, braid stitch over the small stems here, and then I've edged many other elements with silver. And then our little butterfly right here also has a silver body worked of alternating strips of silver tambour thread and silver bright check pearl. He also has really beautiful little needle lace wings stitched with a gossamer fine thread to make him look really delicate and beautiful. The leaves on the center element are all needle lace and then that's edged with a silver twist. And then the center stems are a gorgeous over twist. This is one of my favorite techniques. I will be teaching this in an upcoming project if you're interested in it. And then the grounds here got needle lace on either side and then in the center this these are couch down sorry that's my hair <laughs> these are couch down loops of silk wrapped gimp so I just looped the gimp stitched it down looped 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 looped, looped and kept on going and then laid them over each other in rows it was time intensive, but it's a really cool technique. It doesn't look like that much until you look closer and realize what's really going on there. So this is a panel that really rewards full, uh, closer study because it has a lot of really wonderful details. This is just one of my favorite things that I've done. I absolutely love this piece. And then the vibrant red, silver, and white really complements the vibrant pink of the interior. So with that, let's move back to forward view. I just, I really love this panel. I think it's probably one of my favorite things I have ever stitched. I also think it just said that, so you know I mean it. Anyways, oh no, I can't close that. I'm gonna have to open this again. Oops. So as I was telling you when I introduced this casket, this is a very different interior type to the Britomart casket, although it has the same exterior dimensions. So if I remove this top tray and I push this hidden button to take out my sliding panel, it reveals another set of drawers behind it in addition to the drawers that you can see. And those actually aren't the only, you know what, whatever. I'm just in pajamas and you guys will have to. So you've got this front row of drawers, all of which have embroidered fronts. A little casket toy in there. That's one of Amy Mitten's casket keepsakes. This is her pomegranate thread winder holder front and you can actually sorry it's been a while since I've done this pull out a set of drawers behind the first row of drawers another casket toy I did a full set of toys for this because I really wanted to emphasize and puzzle box nature of this piece. So for both of these top rows of drawers, the hidden drawer row, and then this row that you see here, there is the same set of hidden drawers behind your front row. This box, this box has a lot of secrets. And then if we look inside some of these drawers, there are more casket toys. This is my original of the Elizabethan Valentine that I stitched for myself. It was admired so much that I decided to make it into a class. The original one lives in here. 
Oh, this guy's a favorite. I think I've shown him before, I'm not sure. He's a little frog. He's needle lace front and back. And then I made everything, the lace that ties, the tassels, his little legs. He does open, but he doesn't have a cavity like the Elizabethan Valentine, so it doesn't really hold anything. He just opens because he can. Let's see, I might have put some stuff in the back drawers. I honestly can never remember what all I keep in here. Oh yes, I did. This is a needle case inspired by passamentary that I made and the long narrow form means that it's a perfect fit for that back drawer. And then this casket does have one more secret inside it. Oh dear. It's really humid today, unusually so for the Bay Area, so everything's sticking a little bit. It normally slides out a little bit. And this is my record of the piece. The names of too many casket makers have been lost to history. If they ever recorded their names, they got separated from their caskets for the most part. We only know of a couple names still surviving attached to their caskets. It was a good lesson that if you want your story to survive with your casket piece, you've got to glue it in. Don't put in a letter or something that can be removed. Make sure it's physically attached to the box. And I would recommend you do that for the Simple Harmony box as well if you're stitching one. I think we did discuss this at some point relating to the Simple Harmony box, but it's a fitting discussion here as well. And it's the quote from the poem and the date it was finished along with my name. I did this in silver watercolor and then colored pencil on watercolor paper after a medieval manuscript that I particularly enjoy. I thought it fit very stylistically, so all of the drawers and papered spaces have this pink marbled paper on it. And yes, finished March 2020. So it was very important to me that my name and my inspiration, the Marvel poem, survive with this piece. So I went ahead and glued it in, which I can't recommend enough. We can trace a lot of sampler makers because of the habit of stitching their name on their pieces, but that wasn't common practice with the caskets. So a lot of information that we would love to have about the makers and who they were. Yeah, it's sticky today. There we go. Has been lost. And then you can close it all up and see only the very restrained harmonious green and not the wild <laughs> riot of pink in color inside. The element of surprise that you get when you open this casket has always been one of my favorite tricks about it. So this was my first casket, which was stitched roughly 2018 to 2020. I wasn't working exclusively on the casket during all that time. This project had many fits, starts, stops, places, times when I put it away in a sulk only to bring it out much later. So it's not a straightforward journey, something this big, but it's very, very satisfying to be able to revisit the journey once you've finished it and I have always really enjoyed the high drama that you get when you do open this piece and reveal the surprises inside. 
So with that, oops, sorry, I don't want I can't actually see it. I am going to announce the winner of the Sarah Render Chart by Hats, which is my celebratory giveaway to mark my second anniversary on FlossTube. The winner of this is Nanita Butcher. I have commented on your comment. Please send me your mailing address and I will get this in the mail to you, although probably not until after I get back from summer school. That brings me to the close of this episode. I hope you've enjoyed seeing the green casket. I do love this piece. It has a very special place in my heart as the first casket I've finished, but not the last. And there will be another one after Bittermark 2. I just haven't started it yet. But for the next episode, I'll be telling you all about summer school. I'm so excited. It's going to be an absolute blast. So I am teaching, as you've heard, how many times have I mentioned that? But a lot of times. Have I told you I'm faculty at summer school? No? Oh, news. Anyways, I'll be telling you what I taught and why, as there's quite a story behind my piece, and I'll be sharing a little bit of that with you. So we'll be looking at my own finishes for summer school and then I'll be telling you about all our adventures there. My mom might come on as well and tell you what the experience was like for her. There will definitely be haul. Oh yes, you can't go to the attic without haul. So there will be haul, there will be stories, there will be finishes to share with you. And then there also will be some special giveaways as I'm going to bring some pieces of the attic back to share with you, my wonderful viewers. So I'll see you again in two weeks for the grand summer school recap. And until then, happy stitching. <laughs>